thankful that he is a God that is in control. But not only is he in control, he's got a plan for what's going to take place. Not just for what's happening now, but for tomorrow and the days, the weeks, and the months that lie ahead. We've been looking at God's Word the past couple of weeks at the importance and the power of being men and women of prayer. Knowing that when we pray, God is attentive to our prayers. Knowing that when we pray, God just doesn't look down and say, oh, that was neat. But understanding that when we pray, God is delighted because it is developing that relationship that we have with him. And that God desires for us to pray big, to pray bold. God desires for us to to pray at the altar, to get back to that first place where we gave our heart to him. Because it's in that, that moment when we get back to that place where God first touched us that we recognize, man, there was such a joy, there was such a peace that comes. And how we are to pray is to pray beyond what we used to pray and pray for something greater, greater than we can even begin to imagine. Today I want us to begin to look at what God's Word has to say to us about moving forward. Going from where we are at today to the place where God desires for us to be Tomorrow, a year, five years, ten years from now. And it'd be very easy to preach this message and for you to hear it as saying, well, this is what God desires for the church and and what he desires for new life over the next couple of years. But I want you to hear this morning and I want you to allow for the Spirit of God to speak to your heart clearly this morning and to ask this question, Lord, where do you want me to be? Where are you taking me I don't want to stay in the same place. God, I want to continue to move forward. The average person in the world today is not moving forward. The average person in the world today has kind of become comfortable where they're at. We hate that word change for whatever reason. I actually like the word change when it's a change that I want to make. (laughs) But we don't like change because we think change is a dirty word. We think that if things are going to change, it's going to take us out of our comfort zone, and that's actually exactly what change is. But we need change. I thought about raiding my, my, uh, my, my closet or my attic and going back and finding the outfits that I wore in the 80s and wearing it today. <laughs> my son posted a picture on his Facebook page the other day Many of you have already seen it, the picture of me at my wedding with my my best man when I had long, permed, curly hair. I thought change back in the 80s and 90s, that was a fun thing. I mean, I had great set of hair. Man, I wish I had the hair now. (laughs) But if I came out here dressed like I did in the 80s, you guys would have all laughed. You'd be like, what in the world is Pastor doing? See, change is inevitable. Change is something that has to take place. And as we move forward in the Lord, change also takes place. We can't stay the same as we were the day we gave our heart to him. God desires for us to go from one place to the next to the next, to continually be growing in the fear and knowledge of who Jesus Christ is as our Lord and Savior. I believe that God is a forward-moving God. God isn't a God that says, okay, we've reached here, so let's just go back again. God is a God that is moving us from from point A to point B, from point B to point C, and he's never taking us back. He's always moving us forward. Paul challenges us as the body of Christ. He challenges us as the church that we as Christians are to be movers and shake for the things of God. Not just to sit back and say, well, somebody else can do it, but God wants you and I to be the ones that are moving forward. Look, if you would, at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 this morning. Paul is encouraged by 
what the church is doing, but he also finds that the church has become comfortable. That they're not as aggressive as they once were in proclaiming the good news. And so this is what Paul says. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let me read it again. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing, say one thing. Say it again, one thing. There is one thing that I do. I forget what is behind. Some of you just need to forget the past because the past is what's pulling you down today. You need to forget the past. You need to forget those, those things that, 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 that drag you down. And he says, I press on. I reach forward to those things which are ahead. If you're always trying to go back to reclaim the past, you're always going to come up short. You can always say, oh man, do you remember the glory days of the 50s? Do you remember the glory days of the 80s? I, I tell you what, I can't name songs from the 70s, the 90s, or 2000s, but I can tell you songs that were played in the 80s. Why? Because man, to me, those were the great old glory days. That was in the prime of high school. That was when life was great. But I can tell you this, I don't want to go back to the 80s. I don't want to go back to where my life was back in the 80s because God has brought me so much further and to go back would just be to diminish what God has already done. And so Paul is saying, I press forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It always amazes me at the people that try to make the Bible so complicated. They try to pick up God's word and say, you know, God's word says this, and I really don't understand that. They get all theological about it. But Paul here says, I haven't apprehended it all. I can't begin to tell you everything that the word really means or what it really says. But this one thing I do know, God is calling me forward, not backwards. God is calling me to be a man that doesn't look behind, but looks ahead. Paul does the same thing. Over and over, he says, I am going forward with Christ. I am moving onward and upward in the calling of Christ Jesus, my Lord. This one thing, this one most important thing is that I'm going on in Jesus Christ. Many of us are here today and you may have a past that when you look at, you're not too happy about you have a past in your life that some things took place and, man, you just wish you could wipe them out, you could erase them, and, and our past seems to follow us sometimes. But let me tell you this morning, there is nothing you can do about your past. You cannot go back and change what has happened. You can only move forward in Jesus Christ. It's time to move forward. It is time to put that stuff behind and say, Lord, no longer am I going to allow the past to control my life. No longer am I going to allow what, what, what this person did to me to dictate where I am going with you. I'm pressing on. I'm going forward. I'm no longer going to allow for my own stupid decisions that I made in my, my high school days and my college days. I'm not going to allow for the decisions that I made that, that got me to this place to dictate where I'm going from here on out. Because today I'm going to choose to follow after Christ. Today I'm going to choose to go forward. You read the Old Testament, you find that the Old Testament is, is, is really just his story. The Old Testament is history. It leads up to the Christ, to Jesus being born. It's his story being told about his coming. But when you look at the, the Old Testament, we find that the children of Israel, they represent, they represent Christ in the dynamic that that they were God's chosen people. And God had chose them to be separate and come out from the world. But yet over and over and over, when you read the story of Israel, you find that they always mess up. They always find themselves in a jam. Israel was serving the Lord, but we find in, in, in the Old Testament that at one point Pharaoh comes along and he enslaves them and he, he holds them captive. For 400 years they are in bondage, they're an enslaved people. And they get this mentality of being slaves. They don't know anything else. They're held in captivity by Pharaoh and by the Egyptians. And they start to live their lives with a slave mentality. There's so many Christians, I believe, today that live their lives with a slave mentality. 
or being held captive by the things in our past. When you look at the life of Israel, we see that over and over they're taken from slavery into freedom, back into slavery, set free again. Why? Because they fail to continually move forward. Any time that Israel is taken into slavery, it's because they stop moving forward. When we fail to continue to move forward in Christ, it is at those moments where we are taken captive by the enemy again. If we're not moving forward in him, it means we're stuck, we're standing still, and it means at that point the enemy can come in and he can consume us. We find that Pharaoh had made them captive and Moses comes along and says, hey, I'm going I'm to deliver you people. God said, I'm going to be the one that sets you free. I'm going to tell Pharaoh what he can do and, 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 and then we're going to walk out of here. You all know the story about the, tri- the, the t- plagues that came and finally the death angel comes by and kills the firstborn and all the families that were not covered with the blood of the lamb. And Pharaoh's so upset, he says, go, just get out of my sight. Get out of here. Israel, for a brief moment, is all excited. Yeah, we're free. We're, we're packing up. We're heading out. And they head out on this journey. God has promised them, if they move forward, there is a promised land awaiting you. If you move forward to where I'm taking you, you'll be filled with mil- a land that is filled with milk and honey. And so they set out, and things are going great. But the Bible tells us that Pharaoh, all of a sudden, is not too happy. He realizes that all of his slaves, all of his workers, they're now all of a sudden gone. Who's going to get up and make him breakfast in the morning? Who's going to finish the temples, the pyramids? Who's going to finish all this work that had taken place? In Exodus chapter 14, we find this story of the children of Israel walking out and, and, and going out about their freedom. And as they're going about, they come to a place known as the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, they're hemmed in. This freedom that they're going after seems unattainable because they're stopped by the Red Sea. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, it says this. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Why is everybody whining and complaining? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. You a whiner and complainer sometimes? <laughs> we whine and complain. Oh, woe is me. We're, we're consumed. We're, we're not going to be able to get out of here. Why, Moses, why did you lead us out in this desert just to die? Look, the Red Sea is before us. The Pharaoh's army is behind us. We're going to be consumed. We're, we're, we're doomed. But God looks at him and he says, tell them to go forward. Church, forward is your destiny. Backward is slavery. Going forward will bring about the destiny that Christ has for you. If you go backward, it's just going to enslave you once again. The children of Israel could have gone forward and gone through the Red Sea and found their freedom. Or if they said they wanted to go back to Israel, well, we're just going to go back. And if they go back, they're going to go back to slavery. We have a choice and a decision to make today. Are we going to go forward with God or are we going to go back into slavery? This morning I want us to look, and over the next couple of Sundays, to look at the importance of moving forward with Christ. In that passage of Scripture in Exodus, I want you to see in verses 1 through 4 what God had in store. Because sometimes we don't see that moving forward is God's plan. But God is always in control. This is what it says, Exodus chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. The Lord said to Moses... Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piharithia, between Migdal and the sea. They to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think. The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the deserts. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And he will pursue them. Listen to this. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all of his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord's. So Israel did this. 
Church, when God says to move forward, it is not for our glory, it is not for our recognition, but it is for his glory, it is for his honor, it is to lift up his name. When God says New Life Worship Center, move forward, do this, do that, it is not to lift up the name of New Life, it is not to lift up the name of the leadership, it's not to lift up your names, it is to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Moving forward is for his glory and for his honor. But you see, when we go back, It just wipes out everything that God has done. When God says move forward, it's for his glory. So what does it take to move forward? What does it take for us as people, as a church, to go from where we're at to where God wants us to be? Let's look at this word forward, and I've broken it down. I want us to look at each letter and kind of as an acrostic just to see the importance of moving forward. The first thing I want us to see in order for us to move forward, we must have faith. We must have faith. The author of Hebrews packs a whole lot into chapter 11 regarding this idea of the great men and women of the Old Testament that displayed faith by moving forward. The Bible even titles this section in Hebrews chapter 11, it is known as faith in action. That's what my Bible says at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11, faith in action. Faith in action means that these men and these women were doing something. They were just sitting back saying, oh, I hope faith comes. No, faith is moving forward. Faith is saying, I don't understand it. I don't see how it can happen. But God, I'm going to trust in you and I'm going to move forward. Faith in action. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. I want you just to see how these verses all start out. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But here it goes, it says, Through faith, we understand. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered up to God. He didn't just sit there. He offered something. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, went out and built the ark. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into the place that he should have received the inheritance, he obeyed. He went forth. By faith he sojourned, it says in verse 9. Verse 11, through faith also Sarah received strength to conceive the seed. Verse 13, these all died in faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. By faith, in verse 20, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both of his sons. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing children. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his, from his parents. By faith, Moses refused to give in to Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he forsook Egypt. Through faith, he kept the Passover. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Why? Because they marched around. They didn't just sit there and say, okay, let's, let's see this happen. They had to act. By faith, the harlot Rahab Perish not because she acted. She put out the scarlet robe, scarlet thread. By faith, by faith. Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms. By faith. In order for us to move forward, we must move forward by faith. Moving forward by faith. Moving forward by faith means that we don't understand, we don't necessarily see what lies ahead, but we have the promise of God that he says, I will go with you. I will be your guard. I will be your shield. I will be your buckler. I will go with you. You don't have to worry. Just step out in faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, the whole verse says this, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God, I want your rewards. I want your blessings. I'm going to seek after you. And by faith, I'm going to step out. By faith, I'm going to go forward. Matthew 17, 20, faith like a mustard seed. If you have faith like a mustard seed, the Bible says you can say to this mountain, be moved, go here, go there, do this, do that. If you have faith, you can say to it, be moved in the name of Jesus. Mark 10, 52, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. In Philemon 1, 6, it says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. In other words, go forward in sharing. Don't hold your faith to yourself. Take it out to others so that you have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Jesus Christ. It is our faith that moves us forward. 
It is a lack of faith that freezes us. When you don't have faith, you're stuck right where you're at. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. And you see what happens there? It turns into you. I don't know if I can do that. Faith is not about me. It's about him. Faith is saying, Lord, I know that I can't do it, but I believe that you can. Faith is saying, I'm not going to stay where I'm at, but I'm going to move forward. God, I know what you want me to do, and I'm going to obey. That's the second thing. Faith moves us to obedience. We don't obey because we're forced to. We obey because it is better than the alternative. When there is disobedience, there is punishment. But when there is obedience, there is always rewards. There's always rewards. God promises that he rewards those who diligently seek him. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. To obey is better than sacrifice. Some of you think, man, I really sacrificed this morning. I had turned the clock ahead an hour. I lost an hour of sleep. I sacrificed just to get here this morning. It was a great sacrifice. I understand why some of your eyes are going. I understand that. It's a sacrifice. But God says, I don't care about your sacrifice. What I care about is, are you willing to obey me? I don't care that you sacrifice coming to church on Sunday. Are you going to obey me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? God desires our obedience over our sacrifice. It's easy for us to offer up sacrifices of this and of that at times. But are we always being diligent in our obedience? Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. I don't know about you, but I don't want the garbage of the land. I don't want to scavenge around like the bunch of pigs that are being served up at Matt's breakfast. I want to eat the good of the land. I don't want to be like the prodigal son that found himself with the pig saying, oh, my father's people, his servants, they eat better than this. I want to be served the good that God has. It comes by obeying him. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23, it says, This is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline to his ear, but followed the counsels and the dictates of their evil hearts. And look what it says. And they went backwards, not forward. By obeying, we go forward in Christ. By being disobedient, we go backwards. The children of Israel, they disobeyed, and because they disobeyed, they went backwards. When we obey, we move forward in the Lord. So let me ask you two questions this morning. The first one is this, what am I doing that is disobedient to God's word? What am I doing today that is not lining up with what God's word asked me to do? Some of you, you can, you can, without even thinking, you can point out things that you know you're disobeying God in. You're being disobedient in areas of your life. The second question is this, what has God called me to do that I'm not doing? What has God called you? Powerful song, Joe and Vicky sang, will you be the one to go? Will you be the one to take the message to the lost, the hurting, those that don't know? Maybe God's calling you just to speak up in your place of work at your school. Maybe God's calling you just to to go and to, to be a voice in your community. Will you go? What's God called you to do that you're not doing? Third thing, to move forward, we must have a sense of renewal. How many of you found out that the longer you possess something, it wears out? I don't have those clothes from the 80s because I've kept wearing them, they'd finally wear out. Things wear out. Things get dated. Things get tired. They get old and they get broken. 
I think the same thing could be true in our lives as well. If we're not careful in taking care and moving forward, we begin to wear out, we begin to wear down. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Galatians 4, 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ Jesus. We need to be renewing our mind, renewing our life in Christ each and every day. If we're just settling for what takes place on Sunday to get us through the week, then friends, by the time Sunday rolls around next week, we're going to be worn out, we're going to be beat up, and we're going to be just haggard as we stumble into church next Sunday. That's why the Bible says we need to renew our mind each and every day. Because the renewing of our mind brings about strength. The renewing of our mind brings about hope. The renewing of our mind moves us forward. It doesn't keep us in the same place where we once were. But we're constantly moving forward in him. We need to have a renewed sense of urgency in our lives. We need to renew our relationship with Christ each and every day. I need to renew my relationship with my wife each and every day because if I don't renew my relationship with my wife, then guess what happens? My relationship begins to diminish and fall apart. We need to renew over and over and over if we're going to move forward as a church. Next, the W is for a worldview. For some of us, this is a bit more challenging because we can become so consumed with just wanting to take care of ourselves and take care of the immediate things around us that we fail to see God's view. We fail to see what God said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. We think God so loved me that he gave. It's all about me that he gave. God bless me, God pour out your spirit on me, God I want, God do this for me, God move in my life, God I want this for me. And we become so selfish that we fail to see that God loved the world, that God's view is not just right down, just only upon you, but it's upon the world. Now God says I love you, I care about you, God is there for each and every one of us as individuals, but the problem is, is when we focus on me, as we focus on just us, we fail to see the greater need in the world. We fail to see that there are people right in our own backyard at Penn State that don't know Jesus Christ. We fail to see that there are people that are right down the road from us that are struggling, that are going through difficult times. Why? Because we're so focused on me instead of focused on the world. Mark 16, 15 says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God is challenging us to lift up our eyes off of ourself and to look around. Take your eyes off yourself for just a minute and look around. I'm glad that we're not new life of Altoona, but we're new life of Altoona, new life of India, we're new life of Bolivia, we're new life of East St. Louis, we're new life of college campuses. We're not just new life of Altoona. We're not new life that resides on Pi in Pinecroft uh, off of Sabbath Rest Road, on Rich Road. That's not who we are. You see, who we are is more than just this building. It is more than just this group of people. It is going out into all the world and proclaiming we are the body of Christ. It is not just new life, but we are world-minded. We are world vision. We are world-focused because if we just focus on us, guess what's going to happen? We're going to shrink down and we're going to shrivel up and this church will die. Why? Because God says we have to move forward and moving forward is beyond these walls. Is going out into the world and proclaiming, God, you are a God of the world. You're a God of the world. Not just here, but everywhere. When we stop being that, we'll stop being new life. When we stop being a church that has a vision that is moving forward, we will stop to be. Moving forward, the A stands for ask. Many of us don't like to ask. We just take what we get. It drives me nuts when somebody messes up my order. I like food, <laughs> and I want it to be what I ordered. Messes with my head knowing that it's not right. I'm one that will not hesitate 
to say, you know what, this isn't right. Can you fix it for me? Do I worry they're going to go back and spit in it? Yes, I do, but I pray over it. <laughs> I do. I, that's why I pray over my food. <laughs> But I want it to be right. But some people, they, won't add, they will suffer through eating that. And they will grimace at every bite because it's not what they wanted. And, they'll, oh. and then they'll complain about it for the rest of the day. This is, that's, oh, that ruined my day. The meal was horrible. Instead of asking to have it fixed. Too many of us are like that with God. It goes back to the prayer. Oh, I'm just going to suffer through it. Oh, I'm just going to make it through. And we're just going to complain about it over and over and over and over instead of saying, God, can you step into this situation? Lord, I need you right now. One of my biggest problems, in the, and I try and I try and I try to figure out ways, and it just doesn't always work. I have a very difficult time at remembering names. And instead of just saying, can you tell me your name again? Because, you know, it's the 50th time. Can you tell me your name again? I'll be like, hey, what's, what's that person's name? I'll be honest. I texted Pastor Micah at the beginning of the service. I said, what's Matt's wife's name? I knew it, but I just couldn't remember. <laughs> but I asked, because I didn't want to come up here and say, you know, Matt and his wife, whatever her name is. <laughs> but we have a hard time asking. But in order for us to move forward, we need to ask the Lord what he desires. We need to ask the Lord, what is it that you want for us as a body of Christ? Luke chapter 11, verse 9, it says, I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Don't just sit back there and wish that it would be given. Hope that it will be given. But ask, and it will be given to you. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for more of the presence of God. But I don't just sit there and say, oh, I wish the presence of God would show up. I say, Lord, send your presence. Lord, I'm hungry. I want more. God, I want more of your spirit. I want more of you in my life. God, I want more of you in the church. I want more of you. I don't just sit back and assume it's going to take place. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. If you want more of the Lord, don't just sit back there and assume it's going to come. But you need to ask for it. We need to ask God for more and more of his spirit to move us forward into the things that he has for us. Relationships. If you don't have relationships in your life, you're not going to move forward. There's two kinds of relationships. There's a God relationship and there are worldly destructive relationships. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? The number one thing that takes single people out of moving forward with God is a relationship with the wrong individual. I've seen it over and over and over again. Singles that'll come and singles that'll go. Good people, they love the Lord. One minute they're sitting there worshiping God with their hands up raised and the next minute they're gone. Where did they go? What happened to them? Oh, they met Dawn and now they're gone. Dawn wasn't somebody that served the Lord and they went with them. So many people say, oh, I'm gonna date that person and I'm gonna bring him to the Lord. I'm gonna win him to Christ. Very rarely have I seen that happen. Oh, it can happen, but very rarely. You can be their friend. You can lead them to the Lord all you want, but don't start dating them until they're serving the Lord. Because they will pull you down faster than you can pull them up. When you associate, when you, when you not necessarily associate, but when you join in with the things of the world, they will pull you down. See, the Bible says we're in the world, but we're not of it. I have friends today just like Matt, that are atheists, that don't believe in the Lord. They say, I don't want to have anything to do with God. I don't believe he's real. I don't believe there's a heaven, a hell. But they're my friends. But it doesn't mean I go out and I hang out with them all the time. You see, we need to protect ourselves. We need to have relationships that are glorifying and uplifting to God. Relationships that are more important 
to be godly and worldly. Where did they go? Oh, they found that relationship was more important than God's. We need to make a decision in our life. Is a relationship with someone else more important than a relationship with pleasing God? Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, it says this. It says, For my part, I am going to boast about nothing but the cross of our Master Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, I have been crucified in relation to the world, set free from the stifling atmosphere of pleasing others and fitting into the little patterns that they dictate. Can't you see the central issue in all of this? It is not what you and I do. Submit to circumcision, reject circumcision. It is what God is doing, and he is creating something totally new, a free life. All who walk in this standard are the true Israel of God, his chosen people, peace and mercy upon them. It's not being pulled here and there by the things of this world, but it's walking in the truth of who God is and what he has for us, being involved in a relationship with Jesus Christ, in relationship with those in the body of Christ that will lead us onward and upward, that will take us from where we were into a new realm of glory, as opposed to going back into the things of the world. Finally this morning, in order for us to move forward as the body of Christ, in order for us to move forward as individuals, we must have a dream. We must be men and women that are dreamers. We have to dream in order to move forward. Two years ago, we dreamed big as a church, and two years ago, we moved into this building that we're in right now. It's hard to believe, but it's been two years last week that we've been in this building. Two years. Three years ago, four years ago, we began to dream. God, what do you have? God, what, what can we do? We began to dream some big dreams. God brought it about. But I'll be honest with you, God's been kicking me in the rear end the past couple of months because I've kind of just gotten happy with that dream being satisfied. And not saying, okay, God, what's the next dream? Because dreams can be tiring at times. (laughs) Dreams can wear you out. But I'm realizing that if I don't have another dream to look forward to, if I don't have another vision to go after, then I'm going to get stuck where I'm at. And I'm going to be of no earthly value to the kingdom of God. If we as a church just get stuck and satisfied with what we have and where we're at, then we will never accomplish the greater things that God has for us to accomplish. Every risk or every dream involves a risk. That's why it's called a dream. I think that we become a bit comfortable and God is really trying to stretch us and trying to move us out of that comfort zone into a new realm. It's not time to rest as a church. It's time to move forward. It's not time to sit back and say, oh, look what God has done. It's time to say, oh, God, what are you going to do next? God wants us to dream big. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, where there is no revelation, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is he who keeps moving forward. Happy is the one that has a vision, that has a dream, and that is going after what God has given them. Happy are they. God wants us to dream bigger dreams. God wants us to dream greater things. Church, I'm believing that God is calling us to dream dreams that are bigger than what we have. To dream dreams that will be able to build or purchase a building, a place that has a sports complex that we can bring kids in and we can train them up, that we can teach them, that has a kitchen that we can feed the homeless. I'm dreaming dreams that are so big that we have a place that has apartments in it that we can home, house the homeless, house the single mothers that just need a break in life. A place that is so big that we can bring in students that just want to learn the things of God and we can have a school of ministry there that we can raise them up, that we can train them in the things of God and set them loose out in the world to change the kingdom of God. I'm dreaming dreams that are big, dreams that are huge, dreams that are bigger than me, that are bigger than you, dreams that only can come from God. Why? Because if I'm just settling for, oh, God, I'm dreaming for 300 people in church next Sunday, woohoo, big whoop. Oh, it's great, but man, that's nothing. Because the kingdom of heaven is greater than that. The kingdom of heaven has more room than what I can dream. God wants us to dream big dreams. 
not to settle for what we have, but going on in Jesus Christ. Some of you had a dream once. Think back to that dream you had. What was it? What was that dream? What were you to be doing that, that you could see yourself? Man, if that dream was fulfilled, you, you, you could just see, wow, that's going to be great when I fulfill that dream. But for some reason, something came along and stopped your pursuit of that dream. Maybe it was something that happened in your life. Maybe it was something that looked at you and said, ah, you're never going to be anything. Just stop. Give it up now. Michael Jordan's high school basketball coach said, you're nothing, kid. You'll never make it. What happened to him? What's that dream? What do you have in your life that you're dreaming God-sized dreams about? Holy Ghost-inspired dreams. Not just your own dream, but God's dream. Not someone else's dream for you. Oh, you know, if you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. We wish our kids, we dream that our kids one day are going to br- grow up and they're going to be the president, they're going to be the greatest sports star, they're going to be this, they're going to be that. Maybe some of you, you had parents like that. They tried to force you into their dream. And you regret it to this day. But listen, what is God's dream for you? Past Friday night, I had a dream. It was one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. Not too spiritual at first. (laughs) Until I began to think back upon it. But I dreamt that I had gotten in an airplane and we took off and when we got up to the right altitude, they strapped the packs on us, and I was going skydiving. But as we got up above the clouds, and I got to the door, and it was my turn to jump, I looked out, and all I saw were clouds. I couldn't see anything else. And it looked like a sea of glass, just a the beautiful ocean top. It was beautiful. But I kept saying, I'm, I can't jump. I, I don't know where I'm going. I can't see. And the instructor said, if you don't jump, I can't help you. You have to jump in order to make it to where you want to go. I said, all right. And I jumped. For those first couple of seconds, I was just just in the middle of the clouds. Couldn't see anything up, down, beside me. And I thought, oh, I'm in heaven. (laughs) I must have hit pretty hard. (laughs) But then all of a sudden, I broke through the clouds. And I could see the beauty of the earth below me. I could see the other people that had jumped before me, falling beneath me. And all of a sudden I began to recognize, wow, this is pretty awesome. (laughs) This is pretty cool. All because I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to jump, I'm going to go forward. I'll tell you what, I I became the best skydiver the world has ever seen in those couple of seconds. (laughs) I was doing flips. I don't know where it came from. But a snowboard appeared under my feet, and I was like snowboarding in the sky. <laughs> it was great. Trevor, you'd have loved it, man. <laughs> I, I was just snow. It was great. But then all of a sudden, I recognized, boy, I'm getting close to earth. Something's got to happen here. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes the instructor just diving right down towards me. He said, okay, now here's what we're going to do to land. And we landed safely. Oh, it was a dream. It was crazy. I don't know what I ate. But as I began to say, Lord, how does that even relate? He said, it's all about moving forward. You can go up, but if you don't jump, you're never going to experience what I have for you. You see, church, we can build a building up, but if we never go out, we will never experience what God has for us. If we don't go forward, we're going to be stuck in a rut. And all a rut is, is a grave. We're just going to die. It's about moving forward in the Lord. Moving forward in Him. Going beyond what we can see. and Saying, Lord, what do you have for us? What do you have for me? God, I'm sick and tired of the same old thing. I want you to do something great. I want you to move in my life. Take me forward. Take me from here to there. And once I get there, don't let me become satisfied. Lord, let me go further than I ever had before. It's amazing if you watch any of the Winter Olympics, some of these snow sports, the, the snowboarding and, the, and the, 
the ski flippy thingies. I don't even know what they call it anymore. They didn't exist in Olympics before. But you see, men and women kept going a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. Back in the 70s, I owned a skateboard. It was this big. Many of you might remember it. It had metal wheels. It came off of my roller skates. That was the skateboard I had. You'd go down the street and your teeth would chatter and vibrate. It was so bad. I could have never imagined back in the 70s what they'd be doing on skateboards and, and, and snowboards and things today. Why? Because it was moving forward. It's progressed. The body of Christ needs to continually be moving forwards. If we're not moving forward, pretty soon we're going to be dead. And nobody's going to remember and it's not about making our name known, it's about making his name known. Lord, we desire to make your name known. Father, in this place right now, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just confirm this message today. For some of you here this morning, you've been going backwards instead of forward. You've been looking to the past Saying, oh, I remember the glory days. It's time to not look back to the glory days. It's time to look ahead and say, God, I want something greater than the glory days. I want something better. I want something more powerful than what I ever experienced before. Some of you are looking back, and by looking back, you're being hindered moving forward because you're living in the past hurts, past pain trials and you fail to let go of them and move on with God some of you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you experience that joyous occasion for whatever reason you failed to move forward God is calling you through his Holy Spirit come on I've got more for you. I've got more for you. It's not just about salvation. Just barely make it into the heaven. I've got so much for, more I want to pour out upon you. Where are you at today? Are you stuck? Are you just spinning your wheels? You know, sometimes we spin our wheels we just sit there and we spin and we spin and we spin we hit the gas harder thinking oh if I just go a little bit harder it'll get me out of this situation the only way out is to step through the window and take God's hand and say okay I'm getting nowhere where I'm at and what I'm in so Lord I'm going to get out and I'm going to go with you some of you need to get out of that relationship you're in because it's taking you nowhere nowhere good some of you need to recommit your relationships to the Lord again you've drifted apart God's saying come on let's bring this back together what dream did God give you as a child where is that dream today what vision is God giving you today don't listen to the doubters, the naysayers. Listen to the Spirit of God. Some dreams, some visions, they're not realized for years upon years down the road. But it doesn't mean we stop. It means we keep pressing on. Pressing on. Lord, give us here to there, from glory to glory. Do you know Jesus as your Savior today? Have you given your life to him? I'm sure that most of us here today would say, yes, I have. But maybe you're the, that one that's here and say, you know, I've never given my life to him. But today I recognize in order to go forward, I need to do that. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. 
The only way to heaven is through Jesus. You have to move forward. Confess your sin. Lord, I'm, I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. But I'm leaving them behind and I'm going on with you. If that's you this morning, just ask him to come into your life right now. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Savior today. God-sized visions. Take us there, Lord. Take us there, Lord. Just seek his face right now. Just right where you're at. Some of you have been seeking, just, just cry out, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Lord, pour out the gifts of the spirit upon my life. Give me a cause and a purpose. Lord, pour out the fruit of the spirit. I'm not the most lovable person, Lord. I pray that your love would come. Lord, my life has been filled with despair. Lord, I pray that the joy of the Lord would come and be my strength today. Give me peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I'm quick with some people. Lord, give me patience. I want to be kind to those around me. I want the goodness of the Lord to flow through me. Help me not to be mean and angry, but to be gentle in spirit. Lord, give me faith to carry on. Faith to move forward. Father, I thank you today for the forward momentum that you're taking us on. Lord, we just give you the praise. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. prayed that prayer for the first time to ask Jesus to come into your heart this morning. I encourage you just to, to come on up. Woody's here and he just wants to share with you a little bit more about what that means. About the importance of where to go from here. Because it's not just saying, okay, I've done that. What, what do I do? Just stay? No, it's about going forward. But if God has given you that dream, don't settle for anything less. Matt said, for 16 years I've been in ministry, but now I'm where God wants me, and man, is it a joy. <laughs> you see, where God gets you to where he wants you to be, he'll bring about that joy. It was amazing what happened when the children of Israel finally got to the promised land. <laughs> Their eyes were really, wow, I can't believe we complained and grumbled the whole way here. But what does God have in store? Greater things are yet to come. In Jesus' name. Do you believe that this morning, church? Hallelujah.